Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation of The Fact Behind the Fiction, Examining the Fires That Inspired the Persistence of Vision. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to tonight's speaker. Lisa Geary is the author of The Persistence of Vision, a historical novel set in 1908 that explores how the motivations and decisions of one struggling family set in motion a chain of events that leads to a disastrous theater fire. She lives in southeastern Pennsylvania and enjoys exploring historic houses and sites for inspiration. She grew up near Boyertown, the site of the Rhodes Opera House fire in 1908, which partly inspired this novel. Her work deals primarily with the themes of life, love, and death, and the point at which the three intersect. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. So uh, tonight we're going to talk about the two fires that I drew inspiration from when I began writing the book, The Persistence of Vision. That book was basically a fictionalized version of two events, which was the Rhodes Opera House fire in Boyertown and the Iroquois Theater fire in Chicago. So we're gonna begin by examining both those fires and what really happened in, in real life. January 13th, 1908, was a cold winter's night in Boyertown. Around this time in the evening, people were gathering for a production of a play called The Scottish Reformation. The play was being produced by Mrs. Harriet Monroe of Washington, DC, in conjunction with St. John's Lutheran Church. Mrs. Monroe wrote and produced plays that were performed in conjunction with local churches for the mutual profit of both. She wasn't in town that night, but her sister, Della Mayers, was here in her place. 312 townspeople ascended the stairs of the Rhodes Opera House building to the second floor for the performance to watch 60 of their friends and family perform the play. 170 souls perished that night when fire broke out in the theater. December 30th, 1903 was a cold winter's night in Chicago. In the busy week between Christmas and New Year's, the Iroquois Theater was running performances of Mr. Bluebeard every day, plus matinees on Wednesdays and Saturdays. The theater had been delayed in construction and opened later than planned, and so they made an extra push to fill as many seats as possible that holiday season to recoup the lost ticket sales. The theater was brand new, having opened on November 23rd of that very year, barely over a month. The people who came to the matinee performance on December 30th could still smell the fresh paint and varnish on the walls. As many in attendance could vividly remember the great Chicago fire of 1871, it was a comfort to know that the Iroquois Theater was billed as absolutely fireproof. Rather like the Titanic was billed as unsinkable a mere nine years later. But as we'll see, history loves to repeat itself. On December 30th, 1903, 2,200 people attended the two o'clock matinee performance of Mr. Bluebeard at the Iroquois. 602 lost their lives. To this day, it is the deadliest single building fire in American history. This was the Rhodes Opera House after the fire. This was the Iroquois Theater. And if you'll notice in the picture on stage, it circled the arc light that actually started the fire is still visible in this photo and now resides in the uh, Museum of History in Chicago. So the question then is in both these cases, what went wrong? And in both the answer is a combination of factors. We're gonna start with Boyertown. The Rhodes Opera House building is a bit of a misnomer. It wasn't all an opera house. It was a large building sat on the corner of Philadelphia Avenue and Washington Street. On the first floor, there was a bank. On the second floor, there were offices in the front and the theater was on the second floor behind those offices. It was a rather small auditorium, more than what you would think of when you hear the term opera house. And beyond that, beyond the building, there were a row of apartments attached as well. In the theater on the second floor, the center seats 
were secured to the floor. But on the sides and the rear, there were loose wooden folding chairs. That night, there were 200 loose chairs, which became a major hindrance once panic broke out and they were scattered. One of the problems that occurred was that the fire escapes they did have, which there were two, they were located out of windows that were three and a half feet off the ground, which may not seem like much, but when you're trying to climb out of them in a bustle skirt <laughs> of the era, very challenging. They were also not well marked or marked at all. At least one of them wasn't marked at all. So people had to try to figure out where they were. Some people made it out the fire escapes. Some people simply threw themselves out of the window trying to escape. There was a fire escape in the front of the building, but it was only accessible from the offices, not the auditorium. So woefully insufficient for the amount of people who were in the auditorium that night. The stairway leading to the second floor auditorium was very narrow, it was only six feet wide. And on the landing, there was a ticket booth, which cut that space in half. So if you were lucky enough to make it to that stairwell, you were then funneled at the base trying to get out. Now, if you made it to the street, that door opened outward and some people did make it there. But the door into the theater opened inward. So when people began to panic and rush for the door, the crowd ended up pushing the door closed and piling up against it rather than being able to pull it open and get free. Some people got out that door initially, but once the panic ensued, it was eventually pushed closed and the bodies piled up in front of it. The Opera House was a live stage show type thing. They didn't have a cinema back then in the town. So the performance that night of the Scottish Reformation was a live stage play and they had a stereo opticon, or what's, what's more commonly known as a magic lantern, to show between the acts. So they would have an act, and then they would go to magic lantern while they set up for the next scene. The magic lantern would project two images to either create a 3D effect or make one image dissolve into the next. Harry Fisher, was running a calcium light projector at the back of the room while Della Mayers lectured on slides. Harry was a very inexperienced projectionist. This night was his first and only time operating a magic lantern. So this picture is not an actual picture of Harry. Uh, we don't have a picture of Harry with a projector like this because he never touched one again. The problem came when as he was changing a slide, a tube from one of the gas tanks came loose. These machines had two large tanks, one of oxygen, one of hydrogen. One of the tubes came loose and produced a loud hissing noise. Now he's inexperienced. He's not used to running into any kind of incidents like this. And he's fumbling in the dark, trying to fix it and can't get the hose reconnected. There starts to be some stirring in the audience. People are wondering what's going on. Some people start to get concerned. Some of the actors pulled back the curtain to investigate and see what all the confusion was about. And in the midst of doing this, kicked over one of the kerosene footlamps, which began a small fire on stage. This fire began to spread toward the kerosene tank that fed the footlights. Now, several men in the front row decided they needed to act quickly and remove this kerosene tank before the fire got to it and caused a real problem. So as they're trying to extinguish the fire on the stage, these men are pulling the kerosene tank loose to get it out of there. But unfortunately in doing so, they began spreading kerosene everywhere. It got on the floor, on the chairs, more on the stage, and it ignited a muslin curtain. As they tried to open the window so they could throw it out, they said, it was as though the air itself caught fire and there was a fireball that exploded in the audience. This was the cost. 170 people lost their lives 
plus a fireman who was crushed by the hose cart on the way to the fire. The interesting thing about him was the reason that incident happened was that Boyertown had just recently paved their main street with cobblestone. When the fire alarm rang, they decided rather than taking the time to hitch the hose cart up to the horse, they would just manually run it down the street. They'd done this before, it was quicker. Problem was they'd never done it since it was paved and it was slick out that night. So as they were running the hose cart to the opera house, it went out of control and crashed and crushed John Graver against the tree and killed him and wrecked the hose cart, which slowed down fire response even more. John's own sister was in the opera house building that night and died after she jumped out of a second story window and did not make it. This was common. There were entire families in Boyertown that were wiped out in one night. There are stories of farms where people notice the livestock is, isn't acting right and they go to check and there's nobody at the house anymore because nobody ever came back after the fire. Lisa. Yes. May I ask, and this is actually a question from myself, Kate. Uh -huh. This temporary morgue, do you have more information about this? It looks like it's like a drapery or a, or a fabric store. There were three temporary morgues. Um, one, let's see if I remember where they all are. I may have to get back to you on the location of each of the morgues. Um, I know there was one right next door. There was a restaurant next door. There was also a church and I think a department store as well. I think this was the department store across the street. But I could check into that and let you know. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, 25 remained unidentified at the end of the process of IDing all the victims. And those 25 were buried together in a mass grave in Fairview Cemetery. Every year, the Historical Society goes there on the anniversary, the Sunday closest to the anniversary of the fire and lays a wreath at the Tomb of the Unidentified and makes a bit of a memorial for them. And this is a picture of them doing the recovery, bringing the bodies down on boards. The interesting thing about the Boyertown fire is that nobody ever went to jail for any of the deficiencies that occurred. There were indictments brought against the owner of the building and the woman, Harriet Monroe, who was doing all these productions, but no one ever went to jail. No one ever paid rest restitution. Um, while Harriet Monroe was not in Boyertown that night, her sister Della was in the audience and she did not survive. So I think that was part of why they didn't prosecute her too hard. She basically had a nervous breakdown after losing her sister in this fire and seeing the devastation of the town. And eventually she just left town and disappeared. So the Iroquois theater had some similarities, but also some striking differences. The Iroquois fire began when an arc light on stage shorted, igniting a muslin curtain. They tried to lower a fireproof curtain that existed between the audience and the stage, but it snagged. So they weren't able to lower it completely. The other problem was that this fireproof curtain, which was supposed to be asbestos, was mostly made of wood pulp, which some of you sharp people out there may recognize is not fireproof at all. But it's a heck of a lot cheaper than asbestos. And this was a prime theme in the Iroquois disaster. They cut corners everywhere. They went with what was cheapest, what was fastest to get the building up and running. As people tried to escape from the theater, a back door was opened and the icy blast of wind that came in created a backdraft that ignited the air and killed most of the people in the balconies immediately. Another one of the issues with Iroquois was that, like Boyertown, the doors opened inward. So as soon as you have a panic rush of people going for the door, they're just pushing it shut and nobody could get out. There were a lot of doors that were also locked and there were iron gates that existed in hallways 
that were locked to keep people from slipping into pricier seats once they paid their admission. But there was nobody around with a key when the fire broke out. The people who managed to get out of the theater sometimes ran into these gates and could go no further. Another issue in Iroquois was that some of the doors that were locked used a type of lock called a bascule lock, which is shown here. Uh, these were popular in Europe, but not in the United States. So most of the people who ran into this kind of lock had no idea how to even open the door. There was one gentleman who was familiar with them who got one of these doors open, but it was the only one. This is the promenade lobby of the Iroquois. It looks grand, but there's shoddy construction beneath it. At every turn, the builders valued beauty over function. They put in fire exits and didn't like the way they looked because they're unsightly. Who wants to see big exit signs? Let's, let's hide them with draperies. That's much more pleasant to look at. This was very common. There were also a lot of construction delays. So they prioritized finishing the parts of the theater that would impress and draw crowds and skip things like ventilation that were supposed to actually help make the place as fireproof as they build it to be. They also paid off a lot of inspectors to sign off and say that everything was complete when behind closed doors, it wasn't. Ironically, the facade of the building was designed to resemble a monument in Paris that was erected to honor the 150 victims of a flash fire at a charity bazaar. So they didn't learn from that either. Many of the fire escapes were unfinished. Students from the Northwestern University building north of the theater tried bridging the gap between the two buildings with a ladder and then some boards between the rooftops, trying to save a few people who could make it across um, to the other building. Some slipped and fell to their deaths, but they were able to save a few people this way. Some of the other fire escapes that did exist that people made their way down, they didn't go all the way to the ground floor. So they'd get about a story up in the air and just have to jump. Or they'd slip off the railings because it was December in Chicago and everything's covered in ice. There were also no sprinklers in the building. There was no fire alarm. There was really nothing. And this was the cost. 602 people lost their lives. The grandeur was reduced to ashes in its inaugural season. And nobody, again, was held criminally liable. The inspectors, the builders, the managers, everybody pointed fingers at each other and pointed fingers at the victims, saying, well, they were told not to panic. If they wouldn't have panicked, they all would have gotten out OK. And there was a lot of corruption in Chicago at that time. So a lot of people were paid off to look the other way and they did. The insurance company paid the managers $400 an individual for the people who died. And they only gave $75 to each of the families and they kept the rest. So where does that leave us today? The tragedy of 1903 in Chicago led to a reform of fire safety codes in Illinois. After the fire happened, some theaters eliminated standing room. All doors had to open outward. Exits had to be clearly marked and easy to open from the inside, no more confusing locks. The use of panic bars or crash bars also became widespread at this time. Scenery materials had to be actually fireproof and a fireproof curtain had to exist between the stage and audience that could be lowered in the event of a fire on stage. This is the site of the Chicago Iroquois Theater today. It's still a theater, it's not pretending to be fireproof, but it is a heck of a lot safer than the original was. Meanwhile in Boyertown, 
The tragedy in 1908 led to fire safety codes that are still in place in Pennsylvania today. This is the current building as it exists now. Pennsylvania's first fire law was signed on May 3rd, 1909 as a direct result of this tragedy. It decreed that doors must open outward in any building occupied by 50 or more people and must remain unlocked during performances. Second floors must have more than one exit. Fire escapes must be clearly marked and also easily accessible. No more three and a half foot climbs to get to them. No combustible oil could be used for any type of lighting and projection booths must be fireproof and covered with asbestos. So if we have another issue, with magic lantern, at least it's contained. So thanks to these two tragedies, we finally saw the end of an era of dangerously unsafe buildings leading to horrific death tolls in the early 1900s. Oh wait, no we didn't, because once again, those laws were statewide, not nationwide. Three years after Bordertown, we have the Triangle Shirt Waste Fire in 1911 in New York City. As a result of narrow hallways, locked doors, unsafe working conditions, inadequate fire escapes, and 146 people were killed and others after that. But that's a discussion for another time. Any questions? Thank you, Lisa, that was fascinating. And I, um, I just saw uh, something about the shirtwaist fire a couple days ago, cause it just, we just passed its anniversary. Mm -hmm. Uh, if anybody does have questions, please go ahead and type them in the Q&A uh, below, and I will be happy to relay those questions to Lisa. Lisa, during the your presentation, Lisa uh, G. mentioned that Durango's was a morgue, um, mm -hmm. was used as a morgue. Yeah, that that is the restaurant that's, nowadays it's not immediately next door. Uh, back then, it was the next door building. Now they've wedged a building in between them. But yes, yeah, you are correct. Durango's is, is the one that they used as a morgue, which they claim is quite haunted. The, the restaurant is considered quite haunted. Yes. Yes. Okay. I've and heard the apartments, because now the, the Opera House building originally, um, the first floor, I think, is a real estate company and a really lovely uh, little used bookstore called the Book Nook. If you're in Boyertown, check it out. Um, and on the second and third floor is all apartments. So I've been told the people, in the, most of the people in the apartments say there's weird stuff that goes on there all the time. And have you heard about any sort of um, possible para, paranormal in Chicago? Um, I have not, no, but I haven't, I haven't gotten a chance to look into that as much. And you said more than 600 people perished in that fire? Yeah, in Chicago, it was 602. Uh, there were 2,200 attendees that night. Wow. They also, some of the survivors said that they never remembered seeing so many women and children out of performance as they did that day. Because it was a matinee and it was right near the holiday, so the kids were home from school. This is very wow. sad. Um, Ashley says Zuber was the one in, in the photo, she thinks. The borough hall was the other, which was a school church who missed a few days because of the cleaning that was needed. Oh, okay. Does that sound, does that sound familiar to you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, once, once they used the buildings as a morgue, uh, they pretty much had to like fumigate them <laughs> before they could send the kids back in. Yeah. I think it, it, one of them was a school. Oh, okay. I see. Oh, I see what she's saying. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Does anybody else have any questions or comments, anything that they'd like to ask Lisa, either about these fires or about her work? I am also going to share a link to Lisa's book uh, at the library. So if you are interested, it is currently checked out, but you can always place a hold. And I'm gonna put that right there in uh, the chat and I'm gonna put it on Facebook as well. 
And of course, you can always support your local authors through um, independent bookstores. We always love to see you support your independent bookstores. The libraries have a wonderful partnership with Mainline, uh, pardon me, Main Point Books in Wayne. You can certainly get a copy through them, uh, or you could always go and visit Boyertown Book Nook and take a look at the site of the building um, if you want to have a fun afternoon. Fun? I don't know if fun's the right word. Um, <laughs> Interesting. So go, look, at, look at the look at the scene of. I would find that fun. I don't know if uh, most people would uh, uh where there was um severe loss of life uh but i don't see any further questions coming along lisa is there anything else you want to share with us what are you working on now uh i am working on my next novel is going to center around an incident in new york in the late 1860s called the angola horror which was a train wreck that almost killed john rockefeller uh, he was supposed to be on the train. His luggage made it on. He did not. Um, so it's going to be a story about, again, just in an ordinary family who finds themselves in a circumstance of a tragedy and, and you know, how do you handle that and how does it affect your life? Well, that's fascinating. Um, wasn't it one of the Rockefellers who was supposed to be on the Titanic as well? Or am I? I think one of them was and he didn't make it. Yeah, I believe you're I believe you're right. Yeah, and Astor, John Jacob Astor also went down on the Titanic. Yes, yes, I did remember about Astor. Yeah, a lot of big, uh, big money of the time went down with that ship. Yeah, so the Angola horror is what you said you're, you're um, researching now. How, how is your research going? Good, I actually have a friend who uh, lived in Angola, which is how I learned about it. And she's moved over to like Buffalo now, but it's not too far, so. We, we took a scouting mission out there a few months ago to, to check it out. It, it was uh, a train that derailed while going over a bridge over a ravine. Oh, so goodness. Two train cars derailed and slid down into the ravine. Um, yeah, so, hey, fun. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how long do you think the book will take you to write? Oh, isn't that the million dollar question? <laughs> yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, it is. <laughs> I wish I knew. Um, I hope to be further along, but, you know, pandemic and uh, the world stopped and turned upside down. So, um, but I hope to be hitting it pretty hard this year. And uh, I'd like to be posting updates on my Facebook page. Um, if anyone, you know, wants to follow along and see what the progress is, I will keep you posted there. I will uh, actually share Lisa's Facebook page as well. So if anybody is interested in following her, you can do so at facebook.com slash Lisa Geary author, which is now in our chat. And I'll share that as well on our Facebook page. Um, well, I hope you, I wish you very happy writing. No other questions have come across. So thank you for your time and those fascinating pictures. It's, it's, um, morbid, but really interesting. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. No, thank you very much for having me. All right. Have a great night. You too.